I got an email on the weekend from our next guest uh, pointing me towards a uh, piece of research published online called Misinformation on Misinformation, Conceptual and uh, Methodological Challenges. Now, I read the thing. It would bore you senseless. But fundamentally, it's saying, and and it's an American article, and, and here's an interesting fact. Americans are more concerned about misinformation than they are about racism and white supremacy which is quite remarkable. Um, And they, uh, this is, I think, because they've been primed to do so by this trend about disinformation, which New Zealand has not been immune from. And you know the great level, uh, the great efforts we've gone to to talk to the disinformation people and how, to be honest, snowflakey they are in response. Um, and joining us now to discuss this piece, the person who drew it to my attention is David Cooman from the Free Speech Union. David, nice to have you on the on the platform again. Welcome to the program. Good morning, Sean. Good to be here. Yeah, David, this piece of research, and it's quite dense for, for the layperson. Uh, give us your synopsis of what it says. Uh, so just, just before I do that, I think um, it's dense because it's in an academic journal. Um, it's gone through peer review and it's got more than 100 citations. So this is a serious someone, piece of research. You know, two, 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 two reckons on Twitter. Um, yeah. But the synopsis basically is, um, uh, well, they, they sum it up. They say, just like misinformation, misinformation on misinformation could have deteriorous effects. Um, they're saying that there are alarmist narratives. Um, some people have taken uh, good quality research and misinterpreted it or um, cherry-picked um, pieces of information to create a fear and create an alarmist um, sensation around mis and disinformation. Um, that, that's what they're saying. And they've, they've identified six different areas where there's been misinformation about misinformation. Um, and essentially they're saying everyone needs to just chill out a little bit. Um, we need some evidence. We need to be rational and we need to think things through properly. Not to say there's not a problem, but let's be, uh, be careful about how we couch things and, and where we put our energy. All right. So what you're telling me also, and what that tells me is that maybe uh, Kate Hanna and the Disinformation Project and the people involved in this stuff here uh, might also be making those same mistakes and might be part of a global sort of, I don't know, misapplication of academic endeavour. Yeah, I mean, quite possibly, and, and some of the stuff that they've come out with has seemed to be hyperbolic. Um, but I, I don't think there's a great conspiracy around this. I think that just like um, conspiracy theories in general, I think there are people that are predisposed to be worried about these sorts of things and um, will we'll look at one or two studies and not take the full context into account and, and create a narrative around it. Okay. In this very academic, and as you quite rightly point, for good reason, quite dense work though, what do they identify as the greatest risks in the disinformation narrative or the greatest misinformation that the disinformation experts put forward? (laughs) Uh, It gets quite confusing, doesn't it, the language? Um, But basically they say there are are six main problems um, and they break them down into two categories. That is, um, there is a, 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 um, a sense that people think that there is more misinformation than um, than there might be if you if you analyse it reasonably, mm. and then they also say that people overestimate the impact um, of that misinformation. Yeah. So if, if I can run through the six points that they've yep, got in their absolutely. handy table, um, they say that the first one is uh, the, the 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 misinformation is that misinformation is just a social media problem, and so the the argument there is that it's very easy for researchers to go and and scrape a whole lot of. Uh, Twitter and TikTok and Facebook and YouTube, et cetera, comments and um, and do analysis on it. But that mm. doesn't mean that there isn't misinformation in other places um, that are more difficult to observe. And so focusing on social media is, is convenient for researchers, but it doesn't mean that there aren't potentially bigger problems elsewhere that we're not focusing on. Um, so that's that's their point number one. Uh, their point number two is that the internet is rife with misinformation. Um, and so that is when people say that this this ugly piece of, you know, uh, news or this terrible comment has been seen by 9 million people. Um, uh, what that what that means in the grand scheme of things is kind of a drop in the ocean. Um, and while 9 million sounds like a big scary number, um, the alarmists use it to sound scary and big. Mm. But if you put it into context, it's not that big really. 
Um, uh, and then the third one under the prevalence and circulation category is that falsehood spread faster than the truth. And, and what they've been able to use plenty of other research to back up their point um, is actually uh, misinformation isn't much faster than the truth. More people liked the story of the royals getting married, for example, um, than any of these kind of untruths or mistruths. Um, and that we also need to be very careful about how we categorize things. So things are not only true and false always, um, but there are different narratives and there are different ways of Oh, I'm thinking free. back to what just last week or in the last week or so we had a, a piece of research out saying uh, Prime Minister subject to terrible misogyny. Then we asked the question, where did you look? Oh, we looked in the darkest recesses of the internet right. in places that most people wouldn't even go. Right. Which is what we're talking yeah, about is where you can look for what you want to find. Yeah, and but that... that I, I mean, on that point, that's not to say that, that some of those dark places and some of the comments and, and discussions around there are not a problem. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, put it into context, and it's not, you know, millions and millions of people that are, uh, you know, standing outside your home with pitchforks. Um, but it only takes one, right? And so I'm very glad that there are people that are looking into this. Uh, I just think that in the majority of cases, like these <laughs> these esteemed academics are, are writing about, you know, we, we need to take a deep breath and put everything into context and think rationally about it and use evidence rather than mm. uh, emotions to Dave, guide what we're doing about it. Yeah, David, has disinformation and misinformation and this sort of research and the problems identified in this paper, has it been used to attack free speech and to attempt to, on a global sense, uh, restrict people's freedom of expression? I don't think there's any doubt about that. And the um, all of the kind of censorious calls have been largely based on either um, racism or misogyny or, or you, know, it, you know, unacceptable kind of language um, or misinformation. So it's one of the pillars on which the people in power who want to censor us uh, are making their claims. And um, and I think this paper is, is refreshing, um, if, if a little bit difficult to read in academic language, but refreshing insofar as it, it kind of says, hang on a second, this is this is maybe not as big a problem and maybe the answer is not um, censorship either. Um, let's, let's use evidence rather than emotion to guide our response. Let's be evidence-based. Mm. Well, David, I'm so interested in this this morning because in context with the report that was dropped Friday by the Human Rights Commission, right, mm -hmm. um, and, and the Race Relations Commissioner, they are saying uh, white supremacy and racism are woven into the fabric of New Zealand and um, I have got no doubt that they will, when I read the full reports, and, I, and Maya Culper, I haven't yet, they will quote uh, information and research from people like the Disinformation Project to say we are increasingly racist or, or dangerous society. And the problem, I guess, is when you allow misinformation at that level, posing as expert opinion, which mainstream media do all the time with Kate Hanna, for example, in this country, and indeed the public funds documentaries about their slightly whack job theories, the problem is that in, then enters another sphere of endeavour, the Human Rights Commission, and we end up making policy decisions or claims about constitutional reform. I mean, Paul Hunt wants to have a Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission for New Zealand, which is crazy. But yeah. this disinformation at this level about disinformation would seem to me to be as damaging and dangerous as, if you like, common old garden variety disinformation. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's right. And that's part of the point that this paper is, is making. Um, the silver lining to that is that um, the other three points that they make all centre around the idea that um, people uh, are not so easily swayed necessarily and a lot of people see through it. Um, and, and I would hope that our, our fellow Kiwis are are also a bit sceptical about just about everything and, and um, we'll look at these things um, and and not take them as seriously as some people would like them to be taken uh, in the same way that most people do that about misinformation. Um, you know, mo most people look at misinformation and, and even if they share it or comment it, which is one of the, some of the metrics that people use to say it's such a big problem, um, it's often in a, in a tongue-in-cheek or a, um, a satirical kind of a way that they're, they're doing the opposite of what people want you to believe they're doing. So, you know, 
uh, uh, put it all into a very similar bucket. And and um, we just need to be careful that um, uh, those voices aren't the only ones that are in the conversation. Yeah, I, I hear you, David, absolutely. Have you tried at the Free Speech Union to engage with the disinformation experts, as they are called? Uh, the disinformation project, you mean? Yep. Yeah, we've we've reached out on numerous occasions to have them on a podcast, to have discussions, um, to meet, to to engage, and we've been shut down um, every single time. There's another excuse that comes up, um, which is really disappointing because, um, again, one of the evidence-based approaches to mis and disinformation is to um, is to have more discussion and to debate things and to have transparency and and, and introduce trust in systems that you want to be trusted and the best way of having trust in my opinion is to have a conversation with someone but they will they tell us that that, that speaking to us would put their lives at risk well that that's the <laughs> that's what's been implied with us sort of as well and not so many words you guys um, but, well i mean <laughs> take it as you will um we're, we're still very open um and to anyone at the so information we. project the, the free speech and we'd love to have a conversation uh, with you on or off record. Um, you know, I think there's... So they won't discussed. even talk off the record. They won't even get together for a coffee or a phone call. No. Wow. No, we've, we've, been, we've been completely uh, shut down. Ghosted. Every I think the word is ghosted if you were dating, David. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, she's just not that into you is, is what's ringing around in my head. <laughs> Well, this is crazy because, as I say, I, I think this uh, document itself is worthy of discussion. I think it's something that if they are going to continue to be upheld by or lauded by mainstream media as experts, they had better stand by their expertise and their research. They should be prepared to argue their point. I mean, uh, this is crazy. That's it. And, 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 and part of this paper actually talks about some of that as well. Um, and the best way to fight misinformation is to build up trust in yeah. institutions you want trust in rather than to um, amplify the misinformation and create an alarmist narrative around it. Um, and that, you know, that doesn't seem to be what they're doing. So, so the disinformation project and its modus operandi, its refusal to engage in genu genuine open debate and it's, if you like, collective paranoia or extremism in, in the language it's used. That is mirrored by other disinformation groups overseas? Uh, I'm not sure about that, to be honest. Um, I don't know. I would suggest, so based on some of the comments in this article, um, that it's not just those institutions, but also some of the, the commentators and some of the media as well. Yeah. Um, I know it's a very uh, hot yeah. story, disinformation. I'm interested in it too, but... Maybe in a slightly mm. different way than Radio New Zealand, Television New Zealand, and News Hub, and stuff, of course. Yeah, yeah, and the Herald, um, all, all the mainstream and, media, and, and in I, other words. I, I think I think it would be only fair also to 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 say that nothing in that paper suggests that some mis or disinformation is not a problem. Um, you know, I think I think we should be open enough to acknowledge that there can be. Um, serious consequences and there can be issues with some mis and disinformation. Um, but all that it's trying to do is say that, you know, that there are alarmist narratives around. We need to be evidence-based, we need to be sensible um, and we need to look at things into context. I hear you, David. David, I thank you uh, very much for joining us. Uh, I will try and get uh, reach out to the people who published that, see if we can get a right to republish because I think it is well worth a read. If, as you say, a little heavy, thank you for... Um, demystifying it for us this morning. Have a great day, Sean. Cheers. Thanks. David Kimmon from the Free Speech Union. So nice to know that I'm not the only person being ghosted by the disinformation. Ben and I aren't the only people who represent a threat to the life of Kate Hanna. Come on. Come on, Kate. Grow up here. Grow up here in front up on the platform instead of just doing your softy interviews with your mates in mainstream media. Um, 0800 33 is the number to call. We've got 10 minutes or so for some talk back. Um, and I'm going to ask you this simple question. Um, and I've got to say, good on you, Ming Foon, for, for coming on tomorrow morning. Um, but here's a question. Do you think this country needs a Truth and Reconciliation Commission like the one they had in South Africa at the end of apartheid? Do you really think we're that bad? Are we that colonially white racist mofo or not?